It's being called the best TV show of the year. And its storytelling secret can be summarized in two words. You look at my timeline, there's loads of blink removal. This is Simon Smith. He edited episodes nine and 10 of Andal. But perhaps what's most interesting about Simon is, he's a huge fan of YouTube. Thomas Flight, Mr. Beast, Tommy in it. The most amazing pieces of editing that I've seen have come from TikTok videos. We spoke with Simon about YouTube editing trends and we broke down the editing of one of Andal's iconic scenes. And Simon reveals a storytelling technique that web creators have been missing this whole time. I have to be very honest straight away. This for me was I think the best television I've seen this year. And it was very unexpected. I think I, I think due to the nature of the show being a very secondary character from Rogue One. And it's like, I don't think people were particularly excited. And then when the first episodes came out, I was like, oh, wait, this is going to be something special. And then we all started tuning in and we all started getting incredibly excited for it. And so I'm very excited to talk to you about the show, talk about your experiences of the show and I, what it was and some of your creative decisions in making those episodes. So I'd watched The Mandalorian with my kids and, and absolutely loved it, thought it was amazing. I'd watched Obi-Wan and loved that and, you know, a big fan of, of the people involved in that. And then I knew that this was the opposite, right? It was the opposite to those shows. Um, it, it, there was no lightsabers, there's no Jedis. In terms of the episode that I landed on, like I think I I met there, there were three directors across the series. I I met and talked to them about cutting on the first block of episodes. I met and talked to them about cutting on the second block of episodes. And my schedule and their schedule just fit that I landed on these two episodes. And yeah, I got really lucky. Like <laughs> <laughs> Prison Breakout is a is a is a very very lucky episode to land on. But one of my favorite scenes I got to cut in in Andor. One of my favorite scenes, in fact, that I've ever had to cut was the opening of episode nine. And it's just um, Dedra and Bix as Dedra is interrogating Bix in this in this two-hander. By the time I come into this series, these are two superb actors who have totally found their characters. They, they, they know what they're doing. They're firing on all cylinders. And I get this, you know, this scene through in my dailies. What Dedra, Denise, uh, the actress, just did there, she like cricked her neck. And it was just such a, a, a brilliant character moment. Like she only did it in that one take. We would have experimented with lots of different cricks of necks. Yeah. <laughs> I've recognized something in her performance. I'm like, oh, right. How can I make sure that we do justice to, to the clever thing that she's doing there, you know? You pull in the net and the easy thing, the quick thing, is to assume that everything you've dragged to shore. Oh mate, this one shot goes on for ages. Now, some of this here, we are reframing subtly in the in in the edit as well and we're pushing in slightly to to take us into her and to almost increase the the value of this one shot. And here, she comes down the velociraptor, right? I always felt like the shot in Jurassic Park where like the dinosaur just like dips its head in the frame and like smells her, you know. And and that again only happened in that one take that she like dip down perfectly and dip back out again. And we kind of subtly reframed to, to emphasize that. We brought in Salmon Park last night. We tracked him to a radio hidden in his yard. There would have been tons like of performances of Bix and how she reacted. And, and we were choosing which one we used for that moment. What look back to Deirdre we use, how panicked she looked, how scared she looks. You know, same there. Like these, are, I, I would have pulled from her take they would have rolled that take on her for the duration of the scene i would have pulled all the reactions that 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 we liked you know what i mean and uh, made sure that we were using the absolute best reaction for the for the right moment there so you had like a ton of reactions and you tried out each one like okay this one seems to be the best reaction for the emotion that you wanted yeah and i think as well like i love the blocking of this i love how they let deirdre walk around and like kept bix in the same place um, but you do get a sense of the geography and, you know, how the room works and how each shot evolves into a different shot. You know, like now this is a diff like it's that kind of Spielberg one um technique where a shot might be on someone, but then it evolves and becomes on someone else or becomes a wide shot or a two shot or whatever. You're in my net, Bix. As Dedra bends down here, the camera on the day would have got the move but then i'll find a way of making that move even greater by either stabilizing it or or or, or making sure the move just you know moves in a downward sweep instead of a, 
a, a, a bob or something like that at the end you know we, we kind of make everything feel like you know like there's a flow to it a, a musical flow to it or or you know a, a, a real visual rhythm to to what you're seeing for me the way i interpreted that is her gesture also controlling the camera makes her feel so powerful as well she's also forcing the camera to readjust to her i own this room because the camera's had to readjust to me all the time and i think at the end of this shot it's probably one of those moments where i i stretch out the time or i do an eye fix or something here you know together yeah i think i've stretched out that moment just to rhythm into this shot when was the last time you spoke with cassie and andor one of my favorite subtle things i noticed in that scene is that they were not blinking that was a really intense scene i don't think i noticed them blink at one point was that an intentional edit choice sometimes with that where you want to cut out you might have a character blink and you wouldn't want to include that blink you wouldn't want them to like they're meant to be focused and what was captured in camera on the day because of what was ever happening that person blinked or just naturally they blinked but on camera you don't want to be on a close-up of someone like blinking at that moment so you might just go in and put some effects on their eyes so that they don't blink taking the blinks out at a moment of import you know like where things happening is something that i do all the time like you look at my timeline there's loads of, of blink removal. Why do you think removing a blink uh, affects a performance? There's there's a really famous edit in book that I'd encourage anyone to read called In the Blink of an Eye by um, like three times Oscar winner Walter Murch, like one of the best editors ever. And he would say, oh, when someone blinks is when you're meant to have cut before that. It's like it's like it's given you a human moment where you should be moving the focus. But I don't think he had the... Technology to just remove the blink, right? <laughs> so we, we we kind of both agree that you don't want to see the blink, but his way was to cut before the blink. My way to just remove the blink. I've read that book as well, and my interpretation of that philosoph- of that philosophy is that a blink suggests safety. Uh, suggests like, okay, it's safe for me to blink. In the same way, you know, when you see a cat when they're in danger, they never blink, they stare. And the same way, I think we kind of follow that same philosophy as us as humans. And so, if someone is g- giving uh, terrifying monologue or, or someone is in the chair and they are their, their life is in danger it, the moment they blink that that uh the illusion's broken to an extent it might not be even removing a blink it might be that they move their eyes to look in a different direction i just want to keep their eyes connected and off maybe reality maybe we don't keep our eyes connected that much i mean i'm looking all over the shop at the moment right whereas on tv you just want to glue that in place a little bit and then you know i'll do my sound effect transitions between scenes especially when we went from you know bix and dedra into the prison and then from the prison back bix and dedra because we had loads of fun they had this brilliant script device that she was hearing in some headphones this sound that was so evil that it would torture her it was it was it was a sound torture right so we would we would play with that and how that would then cut into the grinding of like you know the machines that they were doing in in the prison this must apply to you as well say with a mr beast video or even a logan video or or, or whatever a lot of these things the approach can be completely different completely new and i had new things that i did on this i've never done before but i think one of your skills has to be to be able to quickly adapt and and work out how to do something how to problem solve and how to get the best out of something so for the prison break on this before they shot the prison break i get this uh file given to me which which is what's called a stunt biz right i've never i've never heard of a stunt biz before um i've not worked on a show that's had a stunt biz before i've had previews and i've had post viz but i didn't know what stunt biz was so I open up this quick time and a stump viz is the entire set piece of the prison break already filmed, already edited, already got sound effects on it, <laughs> already got music on it, even got some after effects like, you know, blaster guns on it and stuff like that. Um, but the guys in it are all stump men in their normal clothes and they're in a warehouse with cardboard boxes for the, for the, for the uh, production, right? So they've shot this thing 
but they've got all the angles and all the editing and, and all that. So I was like, oh, wow. Like, well, what do they want me to do? You know, <laughs> like, like they've, already, they've already done this and it's brilliant, right? So the, the, the guy, the stunt coordinator, Mark Maley, he's like, he's amazing. He should be given so much of the credit for, for the editing of, of especially the prison break episode because he gave me this, you know, cheat sheet. But then because of the scale of the prison break and, and we built, or they built, uh, Luke built a, a, a whole prison inside one of the stages of Pinewood Studios. Um, so what Toby, the director, asked me to do was he said, can you bring the edit to the set? And can we just drop the rushes straight from the camera into the timeline as the stunt viz have shot it? And I kind of broke up the timeline and, and had all the shots laid out and had all the uh, sound effects laid out and had bins and and they do three takes or four takes or five takes and I put them in the and they'd have like three cameras running so I'd, I'd get those all in and then I'd start cutting those in and looking for the best takes and looking for the cut points and and that's how we like roughed out the edit right so I would wonder how can I add value and what can I do to add value but what one of the things is is just being competent enough to to make that work right and then two it was it was having the awareness of the storytelling and the edit to go, oh, okay, how we've shot this isn't telling this beat of the story. For instance, I remember um, in the uh, in the prison break, there's um, an element of the storytelling, which is the water coming out across the floor and shorting, and that is what turns off the electrocuted floor that they're all standing on. And it was getting the getting the shot of the feet in the water that I think we hadn't quite got in the stump viz or we didn't have in the stump viz. And we were aware that there was a storytelling element that we needed that. And, and, and because that was all there, we were able to pull that in. And also like, you know, while I'm editing on set, if you think in, in, in drama, editing can often be about performance in a take. It did allow instant feedback for the, for um, Toby, the director, to look at the performance that he's got in context and how else can we do that and how can we better that? So it was hugely beneficial to do it that way and it paid off massively. Definitely a new instance and a new pioneering in the digital filmmaking. But one of the things that probably needs to be done more so creatively on when they've shot it and then definitely making it in the edit would be more so performances. And so there are fantastic performances in this show as well. And so like, was there any instances where I think you did have the that balancing element or the creative choices you had to make to ensure that you got the best performances there's getting the best performances out of them but also doing um the the best justice to their performance right like you like their performances can be always great and and a bad edit can still fuck it up you know yeah. <laughs> like, like make, you want to make sure that you're you know doing justice to the work that they've done so whatever we would have done on set would have been changed and and honed and and massaged and polished loads afterward you might find and we did find that oh there's just too much shooting going on you know we don't need like we we shoot a lot of people shooting we don't need that much shooting we don't need six guys to die like we could probably just have five guys die and still tell the story. So let's let's cut out one of the guys dying and, and and make that work. There's one shot in the whole breakout sequence where I think Diego he kicks the guy's leg, the guy falls down, he gets his gun, he shoots the other guy. And it's kind of this rapid set of cuts, which I love. But it was also finding, you know, there's like a hidden cut point in the whip pan as we go over to the other guy because we found a better performance of him uh, you know, getting hit by the bullet. In, in one take and then, you know, and then use a different take of Diego. Um, so there's all stuff like that that we're, that we're doing all the time as well in, you know, in the edit suite as opposed to on set. I remember that being a very interesting moment. like it because you had to establish a geography of, uh, of Andor reaching for the gun. And so you had to set up that rule. And then, of course, what is the conflict of what happens if he doesn't get that gun soon? And then, and then you get that that those stakes, you know, like people are being killed and also he's at risk if he doesn't get that gun soon. In this whole set piece, um, Andor is actually spending most of his time hanging on the bottom of this gantry while all the stuff going on down below and like secretly hanging on this gantry. It's like, when do you go back to him? When do you make sure that there are shots where you can see him? I mean, there was lots of 
jigsaw moving around where like if I moved one scene, then suddenly, or if I moved the shot, suddenly he was in the wrong place. He was he was up on the gantry when he should still be below the gantry, you know, because I've moved the shot into a different order. So there's there were things like that that we had to keep a kind of keep an eye on to make sure that he wasn't jumping all over the place, you know, in, in his time. All of the other characters like Zor um, and, and Melshi and so on who are, who are in the prison with them, I feel like we did care about all of them. Yeah. So to make sure that we kind of paid that off and did them justice and, and you know, when Zor uh, gets shot in that prison break and and, and dies, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like as an audience watching it, you really do feel that. How do you think you made that happen? So when he gets killed or even for Andy Serkis' character, when it was revealed, how do you think you built that up in your choices? So I think in earlier scenes, and, uh, and you know, I, I quite love these scenes, like um, where it's people around a table um, and, like, and, and that's included in this table where they're building these parts in this factory. It's people around a table. So it's making sure... You know, that people get their moment, that the camera goes to them so that you spend a bit of time with them. You, you get them making their joke um, a, a, about another character. Or you get them getting angry at another character or you, or you get them like helping another character, caring for another character. It's making sure that, that you aren't just on one person. You aren't just on, you know, Diego or, or whatever. And, and I, I thought that was great about this show that, that kind of everyone, everyone, has a backstory. Hello, cheeky segue. In traditional media, the crew gets residuals for the work that they produce. And for a long time, YouTube didn't have that option. Until now. Stir lets creators split their AdSense with their team. If you're an editor, producer, writer, or thumbnail artist, Stir can allow you to take your cut of the project's AdSense automatically. That means you don't have to do the maths, it does it for you, which is bloody great because I'm really crap at maths. Stir's credit feature also lets crew members get credited for their work. Simply paste the video into Stir, request a credit, and once approved, it appears on your profile. This is web media's version of IMDb, so don't miss out on this opportunity to get credit for your work. There was something really, really interesting produced just the writing of the show and it probably gave you really great editing opportunities of to an extent, part of Andor's arc for this whole season was him, the moments that led to him choosing to be a leader, him choosing to be a rebel. And because of that, to an extent, kind of made him a relatively passive character throughout this show. But that did give incredible opportunities for other people to be helping towards that arc. And so actually create a really fascinating balance. Depending on who you cut to the most, you're seeing it from their perspective. Were you having those types of challenges because of the, the style of the writing or was it actually a fun thing to embrace and actually balance all of those characters out? The way they shot it as well is like every character kind of had their hero shot for their moment, especially on those table scenes. They would shoot it, Adriano and Toby would block it out so that if Targa was talking to Zul, like you shot you know, across those two characters and then you come around for where Melshi talks and, and, and so on. So they kind of helped yeah. join all those connections and make all of those connections. A lot of TV drama is cut with a very specific tool that I don't think is used anywhere else. It's it's called um, script-based editing, where on my screen I have the script and on every line, so say the line is Melshi's line, I then have alongside that line, alongside those words, every uh, you, I can click a button for, or click a, a, a little check mark for every single take. So I can go down that line and I can see they're grouped by the camera angle. So I know, okay, it's Melshi's line. These are the versions that I've got of Melshi. You know, these are the, I've got Melshi. I can just jump down them and quickly compare them. So I kind of like block out a scene using that script it's like, okay, so I know I'm going to be here and then I'm going to go here and then I'm going to go here. Da, 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 da. Uh, click it all through. Like I'll, I'll have watched the dailies um, and made notes and taken into my head, like what are the great parts and make sure that I'm hitting those great beats throughout. But also one of the things that I think when I was growing up and, you know, a big fan of editing, I think I'd been taught this element of edit theory using Star Wars as an example is the, the term meanwhile back at the ranch. Like Hitchcock used to use that as an example of how to edit a piece um, where you have two storylines and you let one storyline peak and then you go somewhere else, right? So just at the moment of peak, you take it 
some you take it to storyline number two, and then you let that one peak, and then you take it back to storyline number one. Star Wars would always be take this story forward, and then we go somewhere else. So the opportunity to know that I was going on to a Star Wars show, and and I could actually do some meanwhile back at the ranch <laughs> editing. So I I look at your videos and YouTube, and I think that's somewhere which I don't know that it's quite done in that way yet i loved you did a you did a brilliant youtube video where you took um you know some hollywood editing and you suggested how it could be better yeah right and i love that but i think that's very 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 cool i think that there's some youtube editing where say someone was to ask me to like just impart some notes that might be useful to to youtubers take a mr beast video for example and and you know you're your video where they were playing hide and seek in the in the in the stadium. With each storyline, let it peak before you go somewhere else, or let it get get just to the point of extreme jeopardy. And I I, I think that that could be pushed further in YouTube. I think that YouTube editors could take that on board. But then I wonder, would it still work? It genuinely was when I was editing that video of the hide and seek in the SoFi Stadium. That was genuinely one of the biggest challenges I had because I was trying that. Uh, I, I think it was trying to, you know, like, is this person about to be found as cutaway as cutaway? And I, and I think I'd had a sequence where people were having close calls. And I did make the creative decision where the peaks of the moments were people just be almost being caught. And there was this close calls. And then we come back to them on other instances where they probably are going to be, be escaping. The YouTube language is deliver. Deliver, 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 deliver. Whereas I think UTV has that luxury of we can tease, we can build, we can build, we can build, and then we're going to deliver everything to you all at once in this incredible, overwhelming sequence. Like crescendo. The crescendos. Yeah. And I think you, to YouTube language doesn't, unfortunately, quite have that luxury as much. Because if we're building and building and building and building, the guy on the phones go, well, fuck this, I'm out. Because it's so, because it's frictionless to stop watching. Whereas if you sit down and watch a, a Disney Plus show, it's there's a lot more friction of choosing when to stop, and so therefore you're a lot more emotionally available to allow those storytelling techniques to happen. It breaks my heart because I want to do those types of teasers as well. But I think it's just unfortunately because we have to work with retention. It means I don't have as many opportunities to do that. And so I envy the fact that you get to do that on, on Andor. Oh, that is fascinating. Like, say feature film. I ha I've I've got a few feature films, but um, or a couple of feature films. But what? But one of the big things with feature films is that the ending is the most important part, right? You, you need the ending to be the best it can be, because how someone feels about the very end of the film, what sh what even down to what shot it is, maybe the moment that you cut out where the music crescendos as you cut out and how they feel as they leave the cinema has a, a, a measurable impact on um, them telling other people to go and watch it, the future reviews of that show, you know, how people feel about that. You better get the end right. Like you can do loads of work, but if the ending isn't right, it can, it can make or break something. Whereas YouTube retention graphs, you like I reckon the end bit maybe isn't even watched. And I love actually um, Mr. Beast. He, so I've listened to him talk about how he ends stuff. As soon as it's, as soon as it's ended, it's like end. We're gone. Out. You know, we're, we're, yeah. We're, we're, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's done. Also with that, the most important bit is the first 10 seconds, right? Or the first, what what, 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 what do you call it? The, 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 the opening. The logic is... Uh, well, 100% of people have clicked on that video and 100% of those people want to find the first reason to stop watching. And so you have to deliver straight away. So that should, that needs to be the most invested part. That needs to be the best part. Over time, if your attention's not great, you're going to you're gonna slowly, slowly, slowly lose people. And so, and on average, you would lose 50% to maybe even 60%. And so therefore, only 40% of people are watching your video at the end. So why would you make that the best part? Wow. And in the moment the visual language suggests that the video is over, uh, they're already looking for the next video to click on or to stop watching or to reply to that text. And so uh, it's the logic is you need to end your video before they end your video. Because if your video goes on for another 20, 30 seconds, now that last 40% have now stopped watching entirely, the retention algorithm is going to go, oh, well, everyone hated that video. I'm going to kill it. So it's like, that's why it is. That's why we have to end our YouTube videos so aggressively. How you end an episode 
doesn't determine whether or not they come back for the next episode. So like Andor, you need the end of episode 10 to be them escaping and running off across the across the landscape yeah. with a crescendo. Yeah. Or you need at the end of episode nine the nugget that Andy Serkis's character has turned and decided what's gonna, you know, that he's gonna help the prison riot or the revolt in the prison. It's that like come back next week because this has happened, right? And that's something that just does not exist because you don't there isn't really a YouTube equivalent of a, whether it's serialization or or, or 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 episode structure that makes someone come back for the next episode, is there? No. You can't really trust audiences to be there at the end of the video, so therefore you can't do those cliffhangers. Because let's just say someone did watch halfway through, uh, let's just say an episode of Andor that was on YouTube. <laughs> let's, let's play that game. And then they stopped watching. And then they, they click on the next episode and now there's all this new context. I'm like, well, what the fuck just happened? Well, it's because they stopped watching. You can't, in theory, you can't particularly do cliffhanger endings on YouTube. It would be amazing if you saw a, and I bet there will be a YouTuber just rise up very quickly because they end their videos on a, on a point where you have to watch the next one. One of the things that I find the most fascinating about, uh, let's say YouTube filmmakers, is that we are new filmmakers and we're learning how to be storytellers and we're having the accessibility and the tools to teach us how to be better storytellers. But because of these new tools, it kind of feels like a whole new realm. I would say in theory, yes. Absolutely. And then also giving people a better experience at the end of the video is going to give them a better relationship. At the end of every episode of Andor, I had such a great emotional experience at the end. I was like, I was desperate for the next episode straight away. It's binge watching 101, but I now have to wait a week. I'm now even more excited the next episode comes out. The rules work. It's just we haven't quite adopted or mastered it in our format just yet, but it doesn't mean it can't work. It will work. Something that I find really interesting is um, the way you guys or like, you know, YouTubers use subtitles, right? And uh Specifically, um, there's a guy called Tommy in it who who uses roles, and they're very dynamic, and they very much have a a um, life and personality to to the subtitles. And it, I don't think it's far. It, like it will happen. There will be a TV show or a film that will borrow that. I mean, there was a great um, series on Netflix uh, and, and here in the UK called Gary Hadji, which had subtitles that, that were more artistically done. I mean, going back to Danny Boyle did a film, Slumdog Millionaire, oh, that yes. had very dynamic Fantastic. subtitles in it. And I know that they're very different to what Unit is doing. Um, but I think that grammar of subtitles, especially, you know, on devices where sometimes you're not listening to the sound or whatever, is really, really interesting. You you, you definitely do it in Mr. Beast videos a lot. TikTok and YouTube shorts are a, are a whole other, like, grammar and thing that is evolving and, and, and coming forward. In the last couple of years, two of the most amazing pieces of editing that I've, that I've seen have come from TikTok videos. <laughs> so this is two girls saying goodnight to each other. Notice. What you know and what I know is that this wasn't filmed simultaneously. This was, they filmed one yeah. and then they filmed the other. And they even, you know, filmed another couple of angles as well. The whole re relationship between these two girls has been created through editing. Yeah. Right? Like here, the glitch. <laughs> they just do these glitch. Is that just do these da, 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 and, and they just repeat this moment, which is completely like dialogue. Like just doesn't, like where has that come from? And I flipping love it. Like they're so uninhibited, you know, by the rules of editing, by what you should and shouldn't do, that they're just completely making this stuff up. And it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. That's one of the most interesting things about this current next generation of uh, filmmakers where it's, they're looking at all of the editing rules and went, nah, fuck that. And just doing whatever it is that they want. And the fact that they are breaking away from any traditional filmmaking rules straight away gives it this very surreal experience. And then yeah. that extra element towards it then gives permission for them to escalate, gives them permission to just go weirder and weirder because they are now uninhibited by any rules. I look at something like that and I think, God, and, and there's other ones, especially the ones that are quite rapid in, in what someone's doing or saying. And I think, God, that would have taken me like two hours to edit that. How have they, 
or like more than that to edit that. But often they're editing in camera because they're using the TikTok app where they're like just holding the screen to record and then letting go. Well, I don't know. I haven't used it. Um, but holding it and letting it go and then recording recording the edit as they go along. It's like, it's this whole other movement. You're doing it. You did it on Andor. You recorded it, put it on your computer and edited it straight away. So you are doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And this used to be the case many, many years ago that you would edit on the single roll of film that you had in the camera. You'd, you'd shoot each shot in order. Um, but I think it's, it's like this almost like postmodern, avant-garde, yeah. like style of doing things that I find really inspiring. I, you know, came across one of your videos um, about the editing and storytelling in Finding Nemo, right? And uh, I, I, I had the, you know, huge honor and luck of working on an, a TV episode or something with Andrew Stanton. So Andrew Stanton was the director. And to go on YouTube and be like, right, I, I you know, I want to just absorb as much as I can about Andrew and, and what he does. And finding a video like yours was was amazing. I mean, I, I used to watch, there was a whole series called um, Every Frame of Painting. Yeah. I'm sure you watch Every Frame of Painting. It's it's, it's still on YouTube. It's, it's a it's a brilliant series on, on filmmaking. There's a guy at the moment who, you know, I'm a huge fan of, Thomas Flight. Yes. He makes incredible videos breaking down film and TV and pop culture. Um, and now, obviously, your your channel and, and what you and Jordan do, it's hugely, like, inspiring and also, like, it, it feels like there's a, a camaraderie and a congratulatory thing about all of us, like, willing each other on and encouraging each other and, and all being in love with this same thing. Um, you know, I, I do totally feel the love that you and Jordan have for editing in such a positive way. And I think you making these videos and you, and you doing this podcast furthers the, the, the craft and the art of it, um, in, in such a, you know, a nice, a nice, lovely way. So yeah, like, and, and, and with that, you know, thank you so much for having me on. Like, <laughs> that's really. You kind of hit. I've been desperate for years to share the way I've seen editing, the way I see storytelling, and I've been desperate to share it. Well, the way I see that world for everyone else, and so people seem to be really, really resonating with it. This was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. 